It's a really good thing that the Affordable Care Act covers pre-existing conditions, except when your pre-existing condition is a health plan that you already like. Oh, let's talk about that and the problems about misspeaking next on Get Right with Lenny McAllister, starting right now. Get Right with Lenny McAllister. I want the truth! The way we help bring back America and we build the bridges and bring people together is by making sure we hold everybody accountable in a 360 fashion. So let me close with this. Yes, there is a change that we can believe in, but it will never come from a politician or a government program. You cannot find sinful standing here in the land of Lincoln. So Harvard Dale and Elvis, if we can let the Lincoln we got to move away from the American Idol soundbite nature of politics and back to the American statesman of humble servant leadership that we used to see in politics. It is time to roll out the era of the new, educated, engaged, and energized American citizens. I go to the jail ministry. I speak to the kids in the streets. So I'm never going to lay down being a conservative just as much as I'll never lay down being a proud African American. I feel like a black public money I got coming in. Can't turn my back on the hood. I got love for them. That seems to be a demand of more and more Americans these days when you... When it comes to Obamacare, and uh, we'll talk about that because it seems as though more and more ardent Obama supporters simply just can't handle the truth. We'll talk about that. It's me, Lenny McAllister. It's you and me rocking and rolling on a Tuesday. You know the deal. You know where to find me. Twitter, L-E-N-N-Y-M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R. On Facebook, you know the deal. It's tinyurl.com. Slash L E N N Y M C A. Oh no, I'm giving you the Twitter. <laughs> Just seeing if you're paying attention. See, I'm on autopilot. I'm so used to doing it. You can see it if you're looking at the YouTube broadcast. You can see it right there. It's tiny.url slash Lenny Page. And you know, I'm so excited in some regards to talk about this because as a Republican, these are the things that. It's not, you know, people will say, well, as a Republican, you're saying that these are moments of opportunity in order to get back at President Obama and win the 2014 elections and move forward from there and ruin his last two years of his presidency and then move into 2016 and get Ted Cruz in there. I'm not saying any of that. What I am saying, though, is that this is a moment and agree, disagree with me, Twitter, Facebook, you know the deal. This is a moment for Republicans to understand how not to run campaigns, how not to deal with the public, and most importantly, how not to squander your political capital. If there's one big political lesson for the Republican Party to take out of the Obama era, the Obama presidency, the Obama terms, plural, And you could say it's about race, it's about gender, it's about diversity. And yes, there's obviously a big lesson there. And Lord knows we can sit here and talk about that for a while. But that probably, in this instance, with Obamacare and some of the other things that have gone on, that's probably not the biggest lesson that the Republican Party needs to learn from all this. The biggest lesson coming out of all of this is you can have historic heaps of political capital Pulling into the White House, like Mr. Obama did when he was president-elect at the tail end of 2008, you could literally have scores of nations happy that you won the election for good and, you know, slightly alternative meetings. And that means, and that's fine, you could have that and the goodwill of the people and a an extended honeymoon period because you are the first African-American president or maybe in 2016 the first female president from either party or anything along those lines. First Indian-American president if if somebody like Bobby Jindal gets involved or even if somebody like Nikki Haley gets involved. Or the first Hispanic-American president if Susana Martinez decides to run. Or Marco Rubio wins or Ted Cruz wins. Or one of the Castro brothers decides to make that huge jump and go from there or other people. And then there's different people on both sides of the aisle. So my point is 
It doesn't matter how much political capital you have. If you come across as not being truthful, if you come across as being jumbled, if you come across as being too partisan, all of that political capital that you have accumulated through the goodwill of the American people, through the eloquence of your speeches, through the efficiency and and visionary aspects of your history-making campaign, all of that gets washed away if you don't play your cards right. Now, Democrats, hardcore progressives, moderates, independents, or hardcore conservatives alike have to agree on this point. President Obama has wasted more political capital over the five years that he has been in this role as either president-elect or the president of the United States than people would care to admit. He, this should have never gotten to this point in time. All of the political capital that this man came into the White House with, 2010 should not have happened. Was there going to be a backlash? Yes. Was there going to be a blacklash? Yes. And let me be clear. As a black Republican, I'm, I'm willing to be honest. There was going to be a backlash because he won the presidency and the Democrats controlled both the House of Representatives and the Senate at the time. There was going to be a backlash because there are, not were, there are clearly some people at varying levels of our society. It's not just the grassroots crazy person at some random event in North Dakota. Do not disservice the people of North Dakota and do not underestimate what's really been going on in this country. Now, it's not everything's a a conspiracy against a black man in the White House. Everything has not been that. But it is definitely between that extreme and people thinking that it's some 21-year-old high school dropout in North Dakota with a couple of guns on his sides talking about, I'm going to keep them in check. Look. Again, don't disrespect the people in North Dakota, and don't underestimate all that's truly been going on. But with all that said, there was still a high level of political capital that this president came in to the White House with, despite the backlash that was going to be out there against him in 2010. But when you waste the political capital as he has done... Now, you can blame it on him, you can blame it on his team, you can blame it on the his press secretary, you can blame it on his chiefs of staff. I don't really care where you want to point the finger or at all of the above. But the truth of the matter is, there has been a significantly inappropriate, a significantly wasteful amount of political capital squandered by the Obama presidency. And if there's any lesson for the Republican Party to learn... It is to look at what's been going on over these five years, but particularly with the latest lesson that's come up with Obamacare. Listen, whenever you have an opportunity to talk to the American people and shape the narrative, especially when they don't trust your opponent, most Americans, let's look at the polls after the government shutdown. Most Americans do not like the Republican Party at this point in time. They don't trust them. They don't like them. You knew, as the Obama administration, you knew that this system was not going to roll out as it needed to. You knew there were going to be major flaws. You knew that you could take a severe political hit. And you knew from a bureaucratic and policy set of standpoints that you couldn't even live up to the promise that you campaigned on in one presidential campaign, 2012, and what you sold the American people before you passed the law in 2009 and 2010. You have the opportunity to save political capital, negotiate with the Republicans, save political face, and do the right thing, which would have been delaying this for a year for the individual mandate. Instead, instead of doing that, before October 1st, you allow a government shutdown to happen, and yes, the Republicans take a bad hit. At the same time, though, The system rolls out. It's bad. People find out that their insurance policies are being dropped, which goes back to what I said at the beginning of the show, which is, you know, this covers pre-existing conditions from a medical standpoint, and that's great. But if you have a pre-existing condition called, I liked my health care plan, 
It may or may not cover that pre-existing condition. And then you have a problem. You have a problem in a bad economy where you're struggling to hang on to a job when employers are probably trying to shed these plans anyway, especially if they're small business employers. And if, by chance, you're working two jobs, barely hanging on to one, this was the more affordable plan for you based off of several other options or the only affordable plan for you and it goes away and now you've got to take a different plan that may bump you up 50% in pay, 75% more that you're going to pay, maybe 100% more that you're going to pay in a hard economic time, that's a problem and it's more than just a problem for American families, which is enough as it is. It goes back to the lesson that I'm saying. It's a squandering of political capital that just did not need to happen. I'm starting to think, would love your feedback, whether it's on Facebook or on Twitter. I, again, Twitter, L-E-N-N-Y-M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R. Facebook, tinyurl.com slash Lenny Page. I really am starting to think, after watching this Obamacare fiasco where the president and the administration with Kathleen Sebelius, et cetera, are kind of trying to throw contractors under the bus, but the more they try to throw people under the bus, the more that comes out saying that the administration screwed up, which anybody with half a brain can figure out. I am genuinely of the belief nowadays that President Obama is a great campaigner. I don't even want to say that he's a great politician. If he were a great politician, he would have had more conversations with both sides of the aisle over the course of the past four and a half, five years. Basically five years. You know, A couple months as president-elect, the rest of the time as president. This fiasco with Obamacare would have never happened because guess what? This would, these details about the system being messed up would have come out in a book ten years from now that we would have been shocked to hear about. And we would have said, oh, that's the reason why they delayed it for 18 months. I mean, it works now, or maybe it doesn't work now, but that's the reason why they delayed it. And man, he played that well, because nobody even knew until 2021 that the system in 2013 was really bad. And if they would have released it October 1st, 2013, it would have had very detrimental results for Americans, and it would have made the Obama administration look horrible. A good politician would have done that, and it would have come out, all of these things would have come out as this big narrative in a book. Eight years from now, that would have been a bestseller. Instead of being a soap opera, a very painful soap opera, that many, many Americans are experiencing on a daily basis with this. I, I look at this. You know, I've called him the project manager in chief when it comes to fixing this system or trying to fix this system or finding excuses for this system or whatever you want to say. I don't think that fits. I have said the politician in chief because, you know, he's, he's always playing – hyper-partisan games, and, you know, you could say, well, the Republicans are doing the same thing. Yeah, but they're in Congress. They don't have the bully pulpit and the gravitas of the presidency of the United States. That belongs to one person. It doesn't even belong to a party, and that's what people don't understand. A good president doesn't even belong to a party, especially in tough times, because in tough times, you cannot be exclusively beholden to a party line. Now, there are those that say, yeah, he tried to negotiate with Republicans. Yes, there are instances where he did. I would say in 2011, debt ceiling crisis. I would say with the budget and the Bush era tax cuts in 2010 and 2012, at the end of those years, he did. But there are also many examples where he didn't. And Obamacare was one of them. He could have saved face, could have saved face. Just by negotiating and working with the Republicans a little bit more. A better politician has the relationships on both sides of the aisle that this gentleman just doesn't have. And again, I told you previously, I'm going to call him a gentleman. Until I shake his hand and I see strong, personal, firsthand proof that he's not a gentleman, I'm going to call him a gentleman. So you take that as you will. Just going to do that. These... I don't really understand how somebody that can navigate themselves through a, a campaign basically as well as he did in 2008. And even if I look at 2012, he didn't even do it as well in 2012 as it did in 2008. Maybe that was just a magical moment where all the stars came together and we all should have played the lotto. 
or maybe he, in essence, did play the lotto. Because he wasn't quite the same campaigner in 2012. He still was effective. I mean, again, you go back to the first debate, and if Mitt Romney had anything in the tank for debate two and debate three, maybe he wins Ohio instead of Obama, or maybe he wins Pennsylvania and Obama wins Ohio, and maybe he gets Florida, but Obama gets Virginia, or he gets Virginia and Obama gets Florida, and we're talking about different numbers in November 2012. Maybe. My point is this, though. Probably the best thing that President Obama is showing that he has strong leadership on at this point in time is not project manager-in-chief. In many regards, he's been inconsistent as commander-in-chief. It's not been economist-in-chief because you see what the economy looks like. I can't wait to see what the unemployment numbers look like. Can't wait to see what the unemployment look numbers look like. They're not going to be good. And there's going to be some excuse. That's why I can't wait to hear what they're going to be because there's going to be some kind of excuse behind the government shutdown or this or that. And that doesn't explain the last 20 months or the last what? This has been his economy since January 2009. I mean, we're to a point you can't even blame Bush anymore for that. So it's not the economist in chief either. Stimulus didn't work. Cash for clunkers didn't work. Plenty of different plans didn't work. We keep hearing about building these roads and bridges, and yet we don't see as many people building roads and bridges. We keep getting imagery of FDR, and we don't see FDR type of work. And by the way, FDR with the New Deal didn't get us out of the Great Depression. World War II did. That's, you know, just facts that people ignore in the pop politic culture, if you will. But aside from that, not the economist in chief we thought he was. The number one thing and he's not the politician in chief because he doesn't have the relationships on both sides of the aisle. And he's getting to a point in time where he's pissing off more Democrats. Where I, I talk about books after this presidency is over. I would not be surprised to see a couple of prominent Democrats in the Senate and or the House of Representatives, particularly the Senate, I think, come out 2019, 2020 and talk about how difficult it was to work with this president. Don't be so I don't know who that's going to be yet. But with with the stuff that's come out in double down with um just we're going to switch Biden out and we don't really like Clinton and all this other jazz. Clinton saved that convention by the way. And everybody that saw the speech knows that Bubba Clinton 42nd president of the United States saved the Democratic National Convention in 2012. And here you got this stuff coming out in this book. And yes, some of it's just a whole bunch of rumors going around. But we all know that those two really don't like each other. They tolerate each other. But even still, a good politician makes that smoothed out better. Makes it work better than it has been. It's worked fairly well. But if it worked really, really well, Hillary Clinton might still be his uh, secretary of state for probably another year and a half. Then she would go away and run for president. Versus, okay, I can't stand the stench of this place any longer. I'm out. So he's not the politician in chief that people even say that he is. He's a great campaigner. And yes, some things in a presidency is like a campaign. But you got to be all of these things at the same time when you're the president of the United States. And when you're not all of these things all at the same time when you're the president of the United States, you squander political capital. That's the whole thing with all of this. You squander political capital because you can't balance all of these teacups all at once. You can't wear the multiple hats effectively all at once. And then you get caught misspeaking. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Misspeaking. And I said it before. This president was not elected... Because he had great experience, he was not elected because he had visionary ideas and revolutionary ideas and historic ideas on the economy or on foreign policy. He was elected because he was supposed to be a change from what the culture in Washington was all about. That was his whole M.O., that's what it was supposed to be about. We're going to go in there. We're going to change things. We're going to get partisanship out of the way. We're going to ease the tension that's building up in America. We're going to restore the esteem that America has around the world. 
And we're going to do this together because of hope and change. Because of change we can believe in. You only get to win with that type of motto for anything other than class president, maybe in high school. Through people genuinely believing in your character, genuinely believing in your political character, genuinely believing in the moxie that you're going to bring to the presidency, that they trust you and that they believe in you and they're ready to go on this magical ride with you to make history. And when you start misspeaking, guess what happens? Everything else falls apart. Because if you're just a campaigner and then your campaign promises fall apart, such as the nuts and bolts of your most important legislation, such as the landmark legislation of your presidency, when the nuts and bolts of that starts falling apart and the economist in chief isn't there, the politician in chief doesn't have relationships, The commander-in-chief has an inconsistent record. You get to a point in time where you just let political capital just squander away needlessly. And you know what happens? Your nation stays rudderless. That's the tragedy with this. That's the lesson that Republicans need to learn from the continuing squandering of political capital by Mr. Barack H. Obama, 44th President of the United States. It's not about the racial lessons, even though it is. It's not about the political lessons, even though they're there as well. The number one lesson is when you gain the trust and the political capital from the American people, optimize it not just for policy, but for the sake of investment to increase that level over time. What do you think? You know where to find me on Twitter, L-E-N-N-Y-M-C-A-L-L-I-S-T-E-R, Facebook. Put your comments there as well. I will talk to you on Wednesday. I appreciate your time. I love hearing from you. You have a wonderful day. Talk to you soon. TCNGB, take care and God bless.